and for your courage in coming here when you are quite unaware of what you are going to see. Um, I feel I ought to give you a few words of introduction so that you are prepared for it. Uh, as you will probably know, uh, because it has been well advertised, this is the 150th year of Edward Elgar's birth. And El Edward Elgar is perhaps um, currently, and uh, things will always change, our most um, distinguished English composer. And um, as you will know from looking at your programme, is that what we describe here is entirely true. Edward <coughs> Elgar was appointed as bandmaster at Worcester County Asylum in 1879, and he worked there for three years. The trouble is, not many people know what happened during those three years, and uh, this is what this uh, little story is all about. And um, I do want to assure you that it is entirely based on fact, so look carefully at, uh, and listen carefully to what goes on, because I think you will recognise all sorts of events if you, of course, are uh, diligent um, uh, students of Edward Elgar. Um, but the point behind it, as you will probably realise without uh, too much difficulty, is that he was the first destigmatizer of mental illness. He didn't specially feel he was, but um, often when people said, um, when he did various things in his later life, that he was mad, he said, of course I'm mad. I'm the only one of you that's ever been in an asylum. And of course he was. Uh, uh, and he was quite proud of this, the fact that he had um, um, worked in an asylum. And in fact, his first composition was uh, in Worcester County Asylum. So I'm opening a lid on something which perhaps many of you were unaware. Um, the reason why we're doing this, and one of the reasons behind all this, is to continue to destigmatize it's a terrible word, but it's to, it is the conventional word now, the problems of the mentally ill. Uh, the fact is, is that in many countries of the world, and uh, some much worse than others, being mentally ill <coughs> is the complete switch off. We have been reforming the, or rather attempting to reform the psychiatric services in a small country in Eastern Europe called Lithuania, which only has a population of three million, but in the distant past he used to be um, uh, responsible for more than half of Europe because uh, the Duchy of, Luck of uh, Lithuania was covered a very large area. And, um, but in Lithuania, because it's been a, a former country of the Soviet Union, just to give you one statistic to realise what the problem is, is that more than 70% of the population in Lithuania believe that if you have been a patient in a mental hospital, you should never, ever be discharged. And this explains why there are very large numbers in mental hospitals. And this particular performance has been um, carried out, just to show how things have changed, this has been performed in the town hall in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. So, um, uh, and it's in Lithuanian, and uh, later on you'll understand that it sounds very much better in Lithuanian. But I'd like you uh, to, to remember that um, that's the purpose of this. And there is a little box outside with donations for anyone who wants to give <coughs> money for um, uh, one of uh, the next performances in Lithuania, which is going to be a special play, and the plot of this play on the various of the seats round about you, which is about the trial of Socrates. And Socrates, um, uh, as you know, was... Um, had a long trial because he was felt to be um, a rather aberrant individual, and in this particular play he's made out to have mental illness, but uh, there's a cunning twist, and in the end he turns the tables on his accusers. Um, but we mustn't be too complacent over here. The people in this performance are patients, staff, students. You won't really be able to identify which is which. Um, and just to give you one example, one of the people in the performance, and she doesn't know I'm going to say this, so I hope she doesn't mind, but it just shows the problems of stigmatisation, um, she was dismissed from her work when she was in hospital because 
And this was from a senior, this was from a very long standing corporation in central London, which should have known better, which had its own large numbers of staff and its own occupational health department. And she was dismissed because, as the, the, the uh, managing director, or rather her, her director, wrote to me saying, Well, although she's been a good worker with us, we never realised she had a serious mental illness. So, because she had a serious mental illness, she had to be dismissed. Now, I wrote to the um, occupational health doctor of that, of that organisation, and in fact, I got an apology. But by then, not surprisingly, the person concerned, before we denied, had moved to another job, uh, because where she was treated more reasonably. So, um, I, I think we mustn't be complacent that we've got mental illness uh, stigmatisation beaten here. It's still a major problem. And um, I think that... Um, we have a lot more to do. Um, I'm also, this is um, just flying another hat I wear, I'm the editor of the British Journal of Psychiatry and I'm very pleased today to announce that we're now going to have a new section in our journal called Psychiatry in Music. And we're going to be producing illustrations from music which are valuable for psychiatrists and other people in psychological medicine to know because in fact they tell a story which is important. This is just perhaps the first of those stories. And finally, I wanted to say that we are going to be entertaining you for about uh, an hour and a short time, but we have a break in the middle of, after Act 2 for a little refreshment and to meet each other and say a few words before we move on to Act 3 and 4. <coughs> so without any further ado, I will um, introduce you to The Teaching of Edward, Mark 3. <laughs> The month is July. The county is the fair and bountiful shire of Worcester, where fruit trees thrive and that long ribbon of water, the River Severn, meanders its way gently towards the sea. I'm not about to take you to the centre of this bustling town, but to a place called Poick in the countryside. A place which few people knew, until there, the verdant meadows where Shakespeare found the violets nodding and the wild thyme blowing, they decided to build the county asylum. And to there they came, awkwardly, in ones and twos, the lost ones unable to find a place in a society. That rewards only those who knows the rules and understands when and how and why. For those who could not understand, a rest was prescribed, in fond expectation that when outside order was restored, it would also resemble the troubled mind, a wishful alchemy to turn wilderness, <coughs> wildness into calm. But note, brave intention took a different path as the asylum embraced the wisdom of democracy and redistributed its assets of both good and wretched sense to all in equal part who lived within its walls. So watch closely as you observe each scene, focus your eyes on what lies in between and prepare your senses to disbelieve as sane and crazy shuttles intertween, interweave. Ah, at last I'm here. So this is Worcester County Asylum. It's in the middle of nowhere. No signs, no directions, no hope. What on earth gave Edward the idea of coming here? I know he has to get a job, and I know he wants to try out his music somewhere, but a madhouse? Well, at least he made the decision to come here as a bandmaster. I'm very fond of Edward. At least I was once. But he's so terrible at making decisions. He's such a dither up. Perhaps I forced him into it, telling him we couldn't go on the way we were. He's so full of promises, of ideas, of possibilities. 
but I can't see you'll ever achieve anything unless he gets rid of all these fancies and gets down to something useful. And he's dragged me along with him, making me feel like there's something just around the corner. But round the corner never comes. Two years ago, I had an idea for him. New Zealand, I said to him. That's the place you can live out your dreams. A new country, no restrictions, no reason to feel different from others. And Edward is so bothered by his low position in society. And there's nothing to hold you back. Well, he thought about it. But when he found it would take five weeks to get there by boat, and when he even feels sick crossing the Severn by ferry, he decided against it. Well, I'm going there anyway, I told him. But he said nothing. I've made my mind up to go, but I think he'll stay, and that'll be the end of us. What a waste. Oh, something's going on down there. Good gracious, it's Edward. I wouldn't have recognised him in that new coat. Makes him look like quite a man. He's obviously been playing with the band. He doesn't look that excited about it. But at least it's some sort of job. But where is the band? I suppose they've all finished for the day and gone home, leaving Edward to sort out all the music in the stands. That is so typical of Edward. Leaves himself with all the nasty jobs because he won't get organised. But uh, who's that woman over there? And there's people in the distance. My, my, they must be the loonies. What are they doing out? They should be locked up. And there's Edward, always dreaming. He hasn't even noticed. My name's Maria. I like your music. Mm. Uh, good, good, yes. Can you play for us sometime? Just a little, just a tiny bit. Well, I'm afraid I'm just the bandmaster, and I take care of what the band has to do, and, and and that's decided by the board of administrators. Yes, I know, but the band always plays for the doctors and nurses. Yes. It never plays for us. We just see you from the window, and if the wind happens to carry the sound in the right direction, try and join in. Well, what, what kind of music do you like, then? Oh, I just love that oompa piece you play with the violins and the trombones. The others just pretend to be interested. They just pretend to be. Mrs. Grumble fell asleep last week at your concert. I saw her just before her deck chair collapsed. Why not play for us now? I know you can. I've heard you on the violin. You're really very good. Well, thank you. Please play for me. Just for me. Play for me, please play for me. Yes, but, um, please play for me and set me free. I think I can see what you can be. So hear my plea and please take me on your long journey. Please play for me, please play for me. Just for me, please play for me and set me free. I want the green. Hey, this is why. Look, I've told you I'm really very sorry, but band practice is over for today. There'll be another performance at two o'clock tomorrow, so. <laughs> Work your clock when you know we're not allowed out. There you go, that's your introduction. Look, I've said I'm sorry, but this is just not the right time or place. Um, just come back another time, and then we'll play. Maybe. But only maybe. What on earth is going on? It was not in control. He's 22, but he's just like a schoolboy. There are only rings around him. They're swarming all over the place. He can't stop them trying to play. You are having the music. Come on, I can play too.
Come on! Come on! I want you, miss you, get this, get us the, your band together. Band? Band? You're not a proper band. You don't know the very first thing about music. How do you know? You're the clowns. Music? You don't even know how to follow a score, my good man. Score? You don't score anything. You won't even try. Give us the music. All right. Fine. All right, fine. Okay. But what precisely would you like me to do, pray tell? You can play what we've just played. It doesn't really matter what you play. Just take us where the music goes. Where the music goes. Right, okay, fine, okay. Um, right, let's try a theme on what we've just heard. Where's my baton from? All right, okay, assemble, assemble. Come on, are we ready? Take where the music goes. La, 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 la. Mad people! A 
after years of having them locked up and beaten with sticks, you've undone our work in a single day. Yes, but um, they just seem to be um, rather enjoying the old uh, music. Enjoying? Yes. Interested? Bloody crazed, more like it! I'm going to report you to the Board of Administrators. Immediately! I don't envy you in the morning, Edward Elgar. Act 2, the boardroom at Worcester County Asylum. Edward's in the doghouse. He's been reported to the Board of Administrators following Dr Grumple's complaint about his behaviour. I don't blame Dr Grumple. Edward should have known better. We'll have to see what happens. Anyway, I've just found out today that there's a special event. The asylum is being visited by an eminent senior psychiatrist, Dr. Daniel Hack Cheek, a member of a well known family of reformers in mental illness. Nice to know someone else visits this god forsaken place. This Dr. Cheek apparently has a way with words and is writing a dictionary of psycho psychological medicine. He's looking for material from all sources, so perhaps he'll get something out of this shambles. I feel sorry for Edward, he's completely out of his depth. I don't think, but I don't think the Board of Administrators is going to be too kind to him. Good morning, everybody. I am Chairman of the Board of Administrators of this asylum. My name is Ian McIntosh Vane, but to you, I am Vane. Please excuse the formality, but I need to ensure that the name I am Vane is properly attached to me. I am Vane and, and Vane. I am, I am please don't forget good. I will now introduce to my, my, to my three colleagues of the Board first, Madam. Please. I am Nano Margaret Conlon and I am a matron in this asylum. I stake my responsibility on fairness and firmness. I'm more commonly known as No Molly Conlon. A good asylum is like a clock. I am a pendulum and I know exactly how things tick in every single cog. Remember, no Molly Codling. Now, if I see a hint of Molly Codling, it has to be uncoddled, uncobbled instantly. Isn't that right, Jeremiah? Do What's that? Oh, that's me, do I'm an alcoholic. Oh, hello, everybody. My name is Jeremiah Hind. I am the chief male nurse at this asylum. I look after the inmates and make sure they stay like me behind the bar. <laughs> Hello, my name is Daniel, Daniel Gessenfick. I'm the gymnasium instructor here at the asylum. Um, my middle name is Fighting, so they call me Daniel Getting Fighting Fit. <laughs> I make a sound while he makes a sound mind. They come to the asylum weak. Cursing them alone, but leave sleep, bursting with muscle tone. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings and salutations. You must be knowing by now that I am the deputy chairman of the board of administrators, and I am from Delhi. My name is Shadab Malindra. When I was born, my mother turned to my father and said, Wow! What a baby! He's absolutely amazing! He must be a malingerer! So, ever since, I have been a malingerer. I'm from the morning, dear. I'm from across the water. I'm very quiet and ever so shy. But in spite of this, I am an assistant chairman and head of the hospital medical committee. And my name is Connor of that be seated. You may call me, especially you, sir. Conceited. Indeed. Vain and conceited. What memorable names. Who could forget them? <coughs> My name is Dr. Daniel Hatchuk. 
I am merely a visitor to your asylum, and I thank you all for the opportunity to observe your work. We are called here today to investigate a complaint against our new bandmaster Edward Elgar. Mr Elgar, you are charged with the unauthorised use of the facilities of the Worcester County Asylum Band and the improper use of the personnel of the band and yourself. For the entertainment of inmates, in particular you have chosen to involve the poor said inmates in here, I quote from the charge in the execution music to detriment of their, their mental uh, uh, and physical well-being. This is a very serious charge, what do you have to say? I have no idea I was doing anything wrong. They just came up to me after I finished band practice for the day and asked me to play some music and they joined in. That was uh, all there was to it, I'm afraid. Well, all I did, you saboteur. With great mis respect, Mr. Elgar, you're not answering my question. How do you plead to the charge of band of using the band of band the wishes of the council sign for an unauthorised purpose? Guilty! Well, I suppose, under the circumstances and this rather strange outburst, I must plead guilty. Yes. <laughs> Good. I, I always like it when people make a clean breast of their sins. However, I'm far sure I'm far from sure that you realise the significance of what you have done and how it is undermined the work we are carrying out in this asylum. Joining in, you call it indeed joining in, Mr Elgar, is not something which is encouraged in this asylum, whatever next. <laughs> I can't believe what's going on here. I think they're going to explode. No, they're not. They're going to sing. in this asylum. We will return shortly. Suppose I've been a complete idiot. Ireland bound to leave. Go to New Zealand. How did I get myself into this mess? Well, Edward, you've only yourself to blame. Why are you here? You always turn up when I make a fool of myself. It's always happening, Edward. It's got nothing to do with me being around. You've got to make up your mind about what to do with your life. You can't just go on with no direction, hoping something will turn up for you. You've got to make it happen. Yes, you're right. I'm off to New Zealand next month for my new life. I made it happen. I had to. I couldn't go on waiting for you. There's no reason you can't do the same. I know you've got talent. I know you've got ability. But it needs to be cultivated. It won't come out of nowhere. 
And the real problem with you, Edward, <coughs> is you don't make things happen. You just allow them to happen to you. You're right, of course. You always are. <coughs> just a complete loser. <laughs> What have I done? Where have I led? Is my journey bent on a path absurd? With drunken milestones pointing to a nonsense place with a nowhere view. What did I do? Where did I go wrong? How did I end up here? Where I don't belong I must go at once without a word And find exactly how I heard What have I done? Where have I heard? Have all my options been declared? Is music the cause and should I aim? Or turn my target to a different game? What have I done? Where have I heard? Why does this could come into every song? Should my tumbling themes be no longer heard? This is precisely how I learn. Yes, it's what I do. I'll resign now. Save them further trouble, huh? Well, Mr. Elgar, have you anything to say before we give you our verdict? No. Well, I suppose I'd like to apologise for any distress I've caused to members of the board. Maybe. I came here to practice my music. I'm afraid I haven't got the first clue about mental illness as such. Um, I've reconsidered my position, my career. Lack of it. And I uh, suppose that under the circumstances. No, I must... wait! Our future now is black indeed. We've lost our inspiration. Someone who could take us out of here from a life of desolation. It's not the loss of liberty. Our rooms are gentle prisons. It's that those around us never see and no one ever listens. To all of you I make this plea, though I understand your caution. Let us have time for music too. We just beg a tiny portion. And if you say you'll help this way, I would always be your debtor. And you never know how it will go. It may even make us better. Oh, save me! This would never happen! Ackland, isn't it? Go straight back to your room. We'll deal with you later. As for as for you, better leave as well as for a while as we discuss this. I'm sure we're all agreed we can't allow this type of insubordination in this asylum. I think it would be best for our bandmaster to leave. Yes, indeed. This man will create absolute havoc in our asylum. Not even my esteemed teacher, Florence Nightingale, could tolerate such behaviour. 
It is so disorganised. It is so unnerved like. Ah, Mr. Chairman, um, no more Nicodling, please. I agree with you both absolutely. His days are. I've had here at help him numbered and, and the fingers of his my old shanks. Do you mind? <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me visit your asylum today. I agree. You cannot allow your authority to be subverted in any way in this asylum. Without your firm direction, there would be anarchy. Anarchy. However, it does seem as though your bandmaster has a special way with these patients. When the girl suggested a little music might be a benefit, she may have a point. She may indeed have a point. I could not help thinking that it would do no harm if you allowed a short time, properly controlled, for Mr. Elgar to involve them in music. You could try it for a few months, and let me know how it's going. If it seems to be going well, I might even mention this initiative in my new dictionary. With, of course, proper acknowledgement of your important role. <laughs> well, Dr. Hakchuk, you surprise me. You have taken us quite unaware. Thank you for your suggestion and the important part we may be able to take in making this a success. Are we agreed that this is a suitable way forward? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Good. We will call Mr. Elgar back in. Elgar! Edward, if I may be so bold as to call you by your first name, we understand you are to, you're new to our trade and after proper deliberation, we are prepared to overlook this indiscretion just this once. We also feel it may be appropriate for you to give some of these sorry people a little bit in the way of musical direction. But no more than five hours a week. Do you understand that? I hope five hours only anything else will overheat their brains. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. This is, this is really is most unexpected. I, thank you. Thank you so much, I, members of the board, gentlemen and lady. I promise you I'll bring every last ounce of effort I have to this. And... Only five hours a week, but I'll work with it. I'll do my very best. I promise. I won't let you down. I'm going into more Act three. Two years later, outside the music room at Worcester County Asylum. It's nice to be back in England again for a visit. New Zealand's a great place, but there are only a few people there, and you can get awfully bored watching those sheep. It's been quite a surprise to me what's happened here back in Worcestershire since I left two years ago. And the asylum, I can hardly believe it. And Edward is still here. Amazing. After all that trouble, he's leading the Worcester Asylum Choir and Orchestra. They're making a name for themselves. And today, I understand, they're practising for a special performance. Their exploits seem to be known all over the land. We've even read something about them in New Zealand. And the Commissioners of Lunacy and the Medical Psychological Association have decided it would be appropriate to commission a, a pledge from the orchestra and choir for the inauguration of their new president. And, to cap it all off, that visitor I saw two years ago, Dr. Hack Cheek, is coming. I think I can see the board of directors and Dr. Grumpel meeting with Dr. Hack Cheek outside the music room. Oh, that must be where Edward is practising with the choir. And, uh, and who's that singing? It must be one of those loonies again. But I'm beginning to realise they're not all that different from the rest of us. All right, Nelly? I think we're ready now. <clears throat> and a one, we two, three, four. We live in a song. Very nice. The world of all the ways to go. My records you can fly on. And no one else will want to know. Very nice, next verse. We live in a 
we we have tried to do our best. There are sorry souls indeed. And our Mr. Elgar has done his best to introduce them to the meaning of joy. He's been very good at getting them to practice. We can now hear from them all around the hospital, sometimes a bit too often. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think we need to give credit where it is to be made. Congratulations, Mr. Bain, and your colleagues, including you, Dr. Grumple, for your vision and foresight. You have clearly seen what no others have seen before. These poor people really do have feelings, understanding, and humanity. The music has brought all this out into the open. Even this man has something to do with it. I can truly say, Mr. Bain, you have made what appeared to be a dream, an impossible dream, into the earth. Really, Doctor C.K. Puke, I mean Doctor Hack too. I cannot speak of your kindness, it's just too much. Gosh, now I know why that Doctor Tuke is doing so well. He's got them all eating out of his hand. And they seem so overcome again. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, yes they are. They're going to sing again. <laughs> The lawn at the entrance to the hospital. Now, the year now is 1882, and we return to Worcester County Asylum, a place no longer hidden or quietly ignored, but vibrant as the, as the spirit of the age, with excitement and possibility. Those we have encountered in our little show, here we see them all again. Edward Elgar, a man suffused with music, waiting for his talents to burst upon the nation, but now still an apprentice to his craft, preparing to move to a wider stage. Maria, escaping from her land of mental limbo and ready to face the world. She's got confidence, she's assured, she's ready wit to, 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 to tread the boards of the music theatre and, and do what she pleases. Anyway, outside the asylum wall, I have a feeling that's where she'll be going. The choir and the orchestra, they, they remained assembled. They're advertising precisely what is meant by unison, ready to perform whenever they are needed, to show that they, are at least, they at least can stand together in a place where dislocation is the norm. This scene, uh, Helen returns from New Zealand, settled in her adopted land she was, but no longer homesick for her former swain. She decides to come home to see the, the man that she missed. 
she muses quite unseen. Uh, basically, she's an observer of our summer scene. Well, here I am again. It's quite a change that frontier town in Littleton in New Zealand. But I can't believe it's now 1882. But Edward has really grown up. I met him yesterday, and though he's only 25, he's so much more confident and he's looking forward to his new post as a violinist in Birmingham. He tells me there's a good symphony orchestra there, and that he's really excited. But he is very sad to leave the asylum. He says it's taken him out of the rut he was in. I like that. I suppose I was part of that rut. But I think it's not just the asylum that's changed him. He's gone all soft on that girl Maria. Nice looking girl. I just can't believe she was one of those loonies once. Dr. Bill, Do Dr. Grumble, has just given her a clean bit of health. He examined her for three hours. He's a gloomy old cove, says the last person who got better was just after he arrived 20 years ago. I wonder how much of uh, Maria's recovery was due to Edward. Ah, oh, there they are. They're walking towards each other on the lawn. Gracious, Maria. You're looking well. So you're ready to leave the asylum. So nice to see people getting completely better. What is it they say about them? Presumed curable. But so few seem to be. Well, indeed, Mr. Elgar. Are you leaving the asylum? Are you absolutely sure? Have you had your certificate of sanity? Sanity? <laughs> Are you, are you absolutely certain? Well, of sanity, no. I mean, how can anyone be sane after working with you lot for three years trying to make mu music make you better or something like that? I, I don't know. I hope Mr. Grumble's in a kind mood. I'd better go and see him. Well, the best of luck. He's in a good mood because he's just given me my certificate of sanity and I'm on my way home. I promise I'll visit you regularly if you're detained. It's <laughs> very kind of you. Well, Maria, this really is excellent news. You must come and visit me in Birmingham sometime and listen to me play my violin. Maybe you can join in with the choral pieces occasionally? Yes, I'd like that. But I'm afraid I won't be seeing very much of you from now on because I know there's a glittering career ahead of you and I'm really very small fry. But at least I've become much bigger fry since I've known you. You probably don't realize how much you've helped me. I wish I could put it into words. No, no more rules. No more regulation. Clear way ahead. The gates are open wide. But what is more? The end of tribulation. Followed every variation 
uncertain steps, then we began to grow. Take hold my hand and join in celebration. Don't ever, ever, ever let this go. We venture forth to separate destinations. We have a bond. But giant strides in tow. So hold me close and joyful admiration. Don't ever let me go.
very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have been singing and talking in this strange language called English for the last two hours. Now we're going to finish with a song in Lithuanian from the author. present themselves once again so you can thank them in a proper and fulsome way. First of all, Dr. Aloysius Grumman. <laughs> Next, our distinguished visitor, Dr. Daniel Hatchew. Uh, 
Alzheimer direction. Doubting <laughs> Alzheimer. Everybody <laughs> Forgetting the youngest member of the cast with her most beautiful delivery, Sophia Clark. <laughs> she is the daughter of the asylum cook. So much better than most of we have nowadays. And it was so threaded together so expertly by Ken the introducer and Helen the narrator. chance to, to listen to them singing these songs. Uh, all the old patients, all the patients together sing in perfect unison. But thank you very much indeed for coming along today. I'd want, I would like to um, um, present um, a, uh, my colleague who's going to help present uh, a bouquet of flowers. Where is she, Anna? Um, to, um, to our, our key performer, Marina. <laughs> and secondly, although she doesn't expect this at all, and she'd be very embarrassed, we've got to present one to Anna. No, no, Geraldine Morris, who I think needs to come and take a bow oh, because she's sorted everything. <laughs> 